Central Asia, once part of the Soviet Union. It's a region dominated by oil, Islam, and enough radioactive waste to terrify the West. China, Russia, and America are all vying for power here. The countries are strategically vital. And they're all called Stan. Uzbekistan is the most repressive of the countries we visited. It is run like a feudal system by Islam Karimov, the president since independence. His permission for a US airbase in the country after September the 11th has made him a friend to the West, but at home he is widely feared. We brought Shahida, an Uzbek living in London, out with us so we had a guide who could speak openly about a president whose picture and diktats are everywhere, proclaiming democracy and rule of law for everyone. I mean, all of them sound like a joke, to be honest, to me. Right. Because none of them is true. It's like an imaginary world, a dream. Uzbekistan's economy is in trouble, but one of the few growth industries in its personal protection. Rich businessmen do not trust the police, and so turn to private security firms. These men are being trained as bodyguards for Uzbekistan's elite. They're controlled by this woman, a former KGB colonel who lost her job after independence when Russians were purged from state jobs. I asked her why she left the KGB and she said that in 1991, when, when Uzbekistan was established, they basically said to her, you don't speak na a national language, so basically we don't want you there. What I find particularly amusing is the um, former colonel in the... Uh, KGB is wearing Winnie the Pooh socks. The place the colonel comes to recruit is the Uzbek wrestling school. Uzbekistan produces many champions of Greco-Roman wrestling. The guy in blue, which is UZB, the shot career, he, he became, he's a champion of Asian games on Greco-Roman fighting. It's meant to be a great honour for these sportsmen to represent Uzbekistan. So they are paid a pittance and officially forbidden from taking other jobs. There was a joke, actually. The guy who was three-time champion of this Greco-Roman fighting, the first time he became a, a, a champion, what happened? He was When he just arrived to Tashkent with his gold medal, he was given a keys from the car, but as soon as the cameras left, he was taken, the Slitsky was taken back from him. That's how they treat sports people here. The colonel then took us to see some of her guards in action. We'd seen the bodyguards. Now we wanted to see the sort of people they protect. So we're off to see the most powerful man in Uzbekistan now, who isn't, as you might think, the, uh, the president of the country. Uh, this is the guy in a blue shirt without the uh, tie. Uh, and can we say we're very sorry to keep him waiting? Gafor Rakimov is one of the most controversial men in the country. Although he's a successful businessman with interests ranging from cotton to soft drinks, he's been dogged by rumours of involvement in organised crime. But no one has produced any evidence to prove this. Police coming. Wow. Isn't this beautiful? It's beautiful. It's, it's incredible. It turns out we weren't the only Brits who have visited the mansion. 
Mr. Akimov is a keen patron of sport and sponsors yeah, the annual rest. Tashkent yeah. Tennis yeah. Open. Yeah, he's a winner. Yeah. It's a rare occasion when Tim Henman won the competition then. <laughs> After a lengthy feast, Mr. Akimov's entourage showed us a copy of the Australian newspaper from the time he was refused entry into the country. They were keen to show us that their boss was framed and was innocent of all charges. This document, which they say is forged, reportedly involved in the distribution of counterfeit US dollars in Poland. Also a possibly significant connection with major cocaine smuggling operations. But it's not completely untrue. Nothing. Yeah. But this document, this, this false document, has it caused you problems for your business? Has it caused you personally? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I would like to ask. Ah, yeah. It's a document. Mr. Rakimov then decided not to talk to us anymore, worried that being filmed in such opulent surroundings might give people the wrong idea. We left with promises to attend the annual Orphans concert that he sponsors. The problem with repressive regimes is that much of the repression goes on behind closed doors. And on the surface, Tashkent, the capital, appeared a relaxed modern city. But there are clues to the country's darker side everywhere. The president is promoting a new national hero, Amir Timur, the Uzbek version of Genghis Khan. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union, this square used to, known, used to be known as Karl Marx Square. And there was a big statue of Karl Marx, actually only his head. And then his head was <laughs> deleted from the square and we got the new hero, Amir Timur, he was known as a very cruel person and putting his statue in the middle of Tashkent and claiming he's a national hero just makes, a makes some people a little bit concerned about what's going, what will happen in this country and how are we choosing this guy as our leader, as our hero, where he was so brutal and killed so many people. This is the main street where young people hang around. We call, we call it Broadway. It used to be called Marx Street before, but now it's like only Broadway. It's a place where artistic people meet. Can you ask him if life is better now or was it better under the Soviet Union? He doesn't know how to answer. He thinks that at the moment it's better. Dipsy may be happy here, but a mixture of repression and a struggling economy means few others share that optimism. One of the major problems in Uzbekistan is that everybody wants to get out of the country. They're desperate to leave. And this is quite different to the situation we've found in most of the other Central Asian republics. So we've come here to a, a marriage agency, a dating agency, which sets up girls here with wealthy Westerners to find out why these people want to get out. Hi. Hi. Hiya. How many girls do you have on your books at the wow, agency? Wow, a lot, a lot. Uh, three big books, a lot of big books. What are the girls looking for? They're looking for a uh, uh, good life uh, because they couldn't find the good uh, life here in our country. Well, I'm just quite interested to know what they, how they view the West and who they're hoping to meet. I hope to meet a nice person abroad and make my future there, because here there is no future. I really doubt that my daughter will find a job when she graduates from school. I don't like the way of life here. Everything is so backward. I lived abroad for two years and I can't compare. Oh, there's Ecuador, Belgium, United Kingdom. USA, Mexico. And what do the guys tend to be like? Oh, very emotional people, very uh, sensitive to my mind, and uh, very funny and uh, with a greater sense of humor. This is our lady, Natasha. She looks Fine. a lot younger than him. Yeah. Well, they look very happy. Yeah. And he looks particularly happy. <laughs> This is sugar. Do you want to try? Yeah, I'll try some. Just a little bit. 
beautiful, right? It looks like mountain. It is beautiful. It's very sticky as well. This is a famous Samarkandi bread. It can stay for a month. You can still eat it because it's very hard. This is a fertility hat because this sign uh, symbolizes uh, sperm. You know what, not that many people in Central Asia and in Uzbekistan know the real meaning of what they're wearing on their... Oops, I got somewhere something on my head. <laughs> Well, we're now about to break the law and do something completely illegal in Uzbekistan. For no apparent reason, the government decided to ban snooker and billiards halls and pool. Just overnight, one day you could play snooker perfectly legally and people played it across the whole country and the next day you couldn't. There's no discussion, there's no parliamentary debate. The parliamentary debate is not possible because the parliament sits on it twice a year, mm. the beginning of the year and the end. What, the whole point. What, happened in what happens in between no concerns no one. Mm. Uh, public discussion, I mean, what kind of public discussion you want if we don't have even the press? Ah, not a waste. God punished me for not abiding the laws of the country. <laughs> As promised, the next day we stopped off at the Orphans Concert, organized by Mr. Rakimov. He funds 35 orphanages across the country housing three and a half thousand children. <laughs> Mr. Rakimov himself was brought up in an orphanage, as was President Karimov. Some say this is why they are such good friends. <laughs> Shahida advised me to limit my questions to Mr. Akimov to the orphans concert. As our president said, president of country said, every man in this country has to do something good. So he's, so he's trying to do his best. He said it's not necessary to be so smart to do such, such simple things. I still haven't got a clue really about the guy, but it is still fascinating to see how somebody with that much power and wealth operates in a country like this. The call to prayer and loudspeakers were banned, uh, I think, about eight years ago, and the official reason for that was that it disturbed the neighborhood people. Whereas nobody really complained about it. This is a Muslim country, I think about 80% of the population are Muslims. And the people were really enjoying this loudspeaker called for Azan. It's, it's a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful sound, and I personally like it a lot. And now you can't hear it. The regime here has an uneasy relationship with Islam. Uzbekistan is a Muslim country, but Islamic militants are secretly battling against the current regime. The terrorist group, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, the IMU, has launched numerous attacks in Uzbekistan. As a result, all mosques are closely monitored and secret police and informers mingle with worshippers. Now there were a couple of guys over there who look like government agents. The service has already begun, but we know that at the start of every service around the whole country, at the beginning, it pays the president of Uzbekistan. It's a way for him to reinforce his power in every mosque in the country. The 
Iman reads a sermon, which, like all others across the country, is based on guidelines supplied weekly by the government to ensure it doesn't include any anti-government sentiment. Government agents listen to make sure the script is followed closely. I'm trying to keep an eye out for the government agents who are here. There's a few guys down there wearing sunglasses inside. I'm quite suspicious of them. We should probably stay away from asking questions about any sort of political repression and, of course, re a religious repression as well. Because in Uzbekistan, many thousands of men are held in jail, often without proper trials, usually without proper trials, just for being pious Muslims, for having long beards and for looking vaguely suspicious. It would be dangerous for the Iman to discuss domestic politics, but he and these Islamic scholars were happy to talk about their travels in the West. Here we sit and talk for hours, but in the US, when you want to grab somebody for a long conversation, people run away from you. In their culture, it's not acceptable to chat for a long time. Well, it means they live according to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, because he said that time is a tricky thing. If you don't use it properly, it will kill you. So Americans are the true Muslims, and not us. <laughs> This is the infamous Fagana Valley, home of various old and new radical Islamic groups, including the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, who were sponsored by Osama bin Laden and fought alongside al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. The spiritual leader of the group uh, is now thought to be in Pakistan and trying to um, get the group going again in preparation for launching more attacks. And everything we're finding in Uzbekistan is that they find a receptive audience for their message out here. I think they get a lot of support. Juma Namangani, the founder of the INU, was killed in Afghanistan two months after September the 11th. His family still live in the valley. Mr. Amir, a lawyer, agreed to take us to meet them. Anger against the government is growing in the valley because the authorities are tiring everyone with the same brush. Innocent Muslims are rounded up regularly and accused of being members of the IMU. These arrests became so widespread that now you won't find a single family in the Fogana Valley which doesn't have a relative in jail. Before his death, Juma Namangani was one of the most notorious Islamic militants in the world. His brother, meanwhile, runs the local sweet shop. This is the wife of the brother. And she says that they're not allowed to talk to anyone unless they warn the police. Mm. And the representative of the police should be during this uh, meeting. Right. I can't imagine we're going to have a proper chat, but... She's trying to give us the ice creams for free. You ring me for a cast, you ring in there. No, she say that it's free because we are we are guests here. So no, we want to pick not. You ring, you don't ring. Oh, please, no more. Have a good day, can. Ma, who's your papa for me, ma? King. So here comes the policeman. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir. Secret police have just turned up. We're eating ice creams. Assalamu alaikum. The driver is getting worried, he's saying that he thinks we have followed the whole way here from Tashkent, which we suspected. Our human rights representative is lecturing the policeman on the state of the law and he's sort of quoting arcane bits of law to justify our presence here and the policeman looks completely bamboozled. He clearly hasn't got a clue. Oh, no, sure. William, William, Simon, Dima. Dima. Dima, how are you? Okay, we had the chief of interior for the whole Namangan region. Who turned up very quickly. Yeah, he was very suspiciously efficient. Suspiciously quickly. <laughs> and then we had security police, then yes. we had police, then we had the water board. 
no, but now we had then we had the representative of local administration who happened to live in this area. What a coincidence! Exactly, and he said, "Oh, do you have any problems? Do you have a, do you have anything to do with the local administration?" And we said, "No, no, no, thank you very much. You can go and you can go on your way." And he stayed. He's, he's still here. As we were finally ushered in to meet the brother, there was one more surprise. Waiting for us was not his brother, but Juma's nephew, who fought alongside his uncle in Afghanistan. What happened to his uncle after his uncle fought in Afghanistan? He died in November 2001 in Afghanistan, I know that for sure. I saw the body. He is one of the few men we've met in the Fagana Valley who aren't, who aren't in jail. I believe the reason is that our esteemed president issued a decree saying that anyone who has fallen into the IMU by mistake or has not killed anyone and who is sincerely sorry and admitted his guilt, these people are to be pardoned. I can't quite understand why his nephew isn't either in Guantanamo Bay or a prison, quite frankly, or dead, um, because he's a self-admitted member of the IMU, Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan, which was headed by his uncle, Jim Namgani, who was one of the most wanted men in the world. The nephew's mother told me that they came to my house and told him about him and brought him to Turkey. The security forces ordered the nephew to, yeah, come yeah, to show up to meet us. So he wasn't there just wandering around. <laughs> Very interesting. We left the valley, where the government's control is at its tightest, and headed north, hoping to find people more able to talk. It looked promising when we were invited to a concert with the country's biggest pop star. But we were about to discover that not even music in Uzbekistan is free from the president's influence. We're going to see the most popular singer in Uzbekistan for the last 20 years, I'd say. She's really a pop singer. She sings Uzbek songs, but in a very refined way. And actually, she's the only one maybe in Uzbekistan who speaks to people. Like a true star. Mm -hmm. Very restrained entrance. I was expecting you to come in a limo. Welcome to Uzbekistan. <laughs> <laughs> Valda Zosmanova is no ordinary pop star. She's also an MP. But at one of her concerts, she spoke out against the government. As a result, it became illegal for any radio station to play her records. But so strong is her public appeal, the government was forced to back down after a year of blacklisting her. I think that the, there is a free, there are free elections in this country and she can stay as a candidate. I think she has a good chance to get maybe 30% of the vote. And ask her if she's going to run. Oh, no, back. Don't. Can I do that? Never ask this question from anyone who's like a who's more or less public figure. She was crying at one point. One of the songs moved her so much. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you knew the one? Uh, about mother. No. Oh. mother. Talking openly about politics here is not advisable. All right, well, tell us about this, this struggle for basic rights, because I think you're also a politician as well. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so? <laughs> well, tell us about your political... You're a, you're a member of parliament. Yeah. And what area do you represent, and how does that fit in with the singing work? It's difficult. It's really But we know you have a lot of energy. But, you know, and uh, political, po- politically... Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm honest person, you know. Uh, in political, it's so dangerous. Be honest, you know. So is this why you had to go into exile because you were saying things in your songs? I don't know really what. Um, maybe in song, maybe it's I have big mouth sometimes, you know. Maybe that's why. Do you feel you have restrictions on you now on what you can say on what you can sing about? Yeah, I can feel it inside, but. Uh, you know you have to be careful. I know it. Whoa. The ancient Silk Road that ran from China to Europe cuts straight through Uzbekistan. There are still a few traditional silk weavers plying their trade, with skills passed down through generations. Do you think we may have actually found the first presidential fan in the entire country? Because he seems to actually genuinely like him. Yeah. For the reason, probably. Mm, yeah. Maybe he's one of the few. You see, I think those carpets are popular so people can express dissent by walking on his face. Well, we are not in Iraq yet. What they do is they boil them to kill off the bug, kill off the worm without damaging the silk, and then under here, there you go, he's holding on already. He's got one there, that's the thread. I don't oh know if you can God. see it there. From the killed worm, you can do um, soap. You make soap from yeah. the dead you worm. Can, yeah, you can. Dead worm, yeah. Dead worm. You can make soap. Plus, you can use this, uh, the cover, to do um, food for um, chickens. Ow! It really burns the fingers as it passes through. I'm going to have to see his fingers after this because it's really. Oh! Let's check I haven't destroyed his wheel. Oh, well, hang on, it's come to the end, that's why. No, the problem's here. Ah. You see? I'm already learning what to do. The next day, we broke our journey at a local restaurant. The dancing was in honour of some students who had just graduated from high school. When they found out we were from the BBC, we got roped into the proceedings. As we headed north, we passed through a Kazakhstan enclave in Uzbekistan, one of numerous enclaves throughout the region that confuse and infuriate the locals. In 1924, there were no stands countries until Stalin set about dividing and conquering the local tribes. Eighty years on, his seemingly arbitrary borders have left lasting tensions between the new states. See, people come here to shop, but before they have to bribe the policemen, so I think uh, the police, Uzbek police, would allow you to cross, to get into the enclave. Uh, this Uzbek yeah, woman buys crockery here and sells it back in Uzbekistan proper, if she can get past the border guards. She's saying, okay, it's easy to get in, to get out, it's very difficult. We are not going, they're not going to official border posts. They're going through the fi- cotton fields. They're bypassing the border posts. Otherwise, if customs see them, they will confiscate everything. 
While here, the Uzbek and Kazakh seem to trade in relative harmony, relations between the two countries' presidents are not so good. Well, the relationship between the two presidents have been very, very controversial since the very beginning because both presidents claim to be regional leaders. And there are constant rows between them. There was a very bad period just three years ago where people claim, just gossips, dirty gossips, that they had physical fight, but no one can prove it. <laughs> She's spreading it on people so people would have good trade, you know, uh, good luck and everything. Kazakh economy is doing much better. There are lots of Uzbeks fleeing to Kazakhstan to find a job there. Kazakhs used to come to work in Uzbekistan. Now Uzbeks were going there. And Uzbeks were see, viewing Kazakhs in a very arrogant way. We even have this saying, you know, if, we want, if Uzbeks want to say, are you stupid? They're saying, are you Kazakh? Like, you know, so now we are being stupid and now Kazakhs are making jokes about us. The arbitrary borders affect more than just traders. The ancient city of Samarkand in the north of the country is populated almost entirely by Tajiks, but was given to Uzbekistan as part of Stalin's divide and conquer program. The dominant language here is Tajik. You cannot really say that, okay, this, this should belong to Tajikistan or to Uzbekistan. I think we all have to share it. It's all our historical heritage. Mm -hmm. So and how are you sharing it then? Well, at the moment, not well, to be honest, provided that even the borders between two countries are closed. But I think in future we really have to come to, into, to understanding that it's all ours. The Emperor Amir Timur, the man whose statue we'd seen in Tashkent, took this city as his capital in the 14th century after conquering most of Central Asia. These great buildings were religious schools he and his ancestors built to spread the word of Islam. The first time I came to Samarkand, I was 14 years old, and I fell in love with the city straight away. No matter how many different countries I visited, I still love the city. I think this is the most favorite city of all I've seen. Thank you for very kindly allowing us to go down and have a look at the actual site where Amit Timur is buried, which is a privilege if you are allowed. There is a legend or a myth that the one who will open the grave of Amir Timur, then the terrible fate will fall onto the nation and the great war will erupt. Now, there were Russian scientists who came from Moscow and St. Petersburg. Basically, the grave was opened on, in the evening of, of uh, 21st of June 1941. And then the elderly people came to those scientists and showed them in the books that you cannot do this, otherwise the war will start. And in the morning of 19, uh, 20, 22nd of June 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Well, because it's not allowed to go up to the minaret, but we kind of agreed that he will, he will help us. He will just pay a little bit of money and he will take us up. You're bribing a public official, should you? Well, but the public, the government should pay enough to public officials for them not to take any bribes and do something illegal. Having bribed the policeman, we went through a secret door behind a carpet store and headed towards one of the famous minarets. Okay, be very careful. Okay. Yep. I see light ahead. Coming down is going to be fun. <laughs> I better stay here. <laughs> Central Asia has always been a crossroads between East and West. It was here in Samarkand in the 14th century that Chinese traders met Spanish merchants and globalization began. It's sour yogurt, but it's not cow's milk, it's goat's milk, organic. Is it better than in Kyrgyzstan? No, that's really horrible. <laughs> that's really horrible. It's got the consistency of a billiard ball. 
and it tastes disgusting. Are you kidding me? It's wonderful. Cultural differences. The other ancient treasure given to the Uzbeks by Stalin, to the anger of the majority Tajiks here, is the city of Bukhara. Well, look how lucky we are. We thought the weather was going to be bad, but the sky is such a gorgeous blue, and this looks amazing. And the God has heard your prayers for the good weather. You think? Well, it's a holy city. <laughs> the holiest city? It's the holiest city in Central Asia. They don't know the secret of this color, how it was made. And they have very big problems during the restoration works. They were trying to approach it and they were somewhere close to it. But you know, the new color, it cannot stay as long as that one. And people say that probably one of the reasons stayed for centuries is that because they mix it with human blood. This tower's had a checkered history. It used to be used for executions, and people who annoyed the local ruler or who committed a crime were dragged up here in a sack and then thrown off the top. People used to gather down below to watch the blood seeping out onto the stones. See, still used for executions. The big domes inside the speaking big imam inside the people's many so people it? before yeah. electronic microphones yeah people could be at this end yeah and they could still him hear the imam at the end yeah. because the the small how many domes yeah. are the small domes 208 208 uh, yeah and the noise the sound would echo yeah. all around the building yeah very clever Fortune-telling is frowned upon by Islam, but even in the holiest of cities there are those practicing the ancient art. She's looking for my future in the pages of the Quran. She's saying that you are a very um, genuine and sincere person, a person with an open heart, with no hidden uh, thoughts. Well, she said that somebody proposed me recently and I refused. She said that somebody proposed to you and you refused? Yeah, but it's true. It's true? Yes. Wow. Yeah, you cannot take their words literally, to be honest. What are you saying? I thought that was a whole idea. What's the point in coming to a fortune teller if you can't take their words literally? Well, it's not like straight. It's not that straightforward. What do you mean it's not like, it, you go to see a fortune teller to find out yeah. your fortune and what will happen in the future? They, they're telling you the directions. Ah, I see. What people say is that they have uh, bad angels and good angels. So bad angels, they kind of reveal your history, your background. Mm. But most of the fortune tellers cannot say exactly what will happen to you in the future. Because what people, what Islamic people say, it because only part of your future is revealed to your bad angels and not everything because only God knows and no one else what will happen to you in the future. I think part of what makes Bukhara so special is just the sheer tranquility of the city. I mean, we're here in this amazing space and there's hardly anybody here, which is great if you're a visitor, but obviously not so good for the Uzbek economy. I'm just interested to know whether, whether you're generally optimistic about the future or, or generally pessimistic. Well, I am. I am pessimistic. I understand that sooner or later, if the if the country's problems are going to be are not going to be addressed by the government, then we'll have a potentially very dangerous conflict in, in Uzbekistan, which will spread out along the, around the whole Central Asia. I can only hope that. The future looks a bit brighter than it appears at the moment. We say inshallah. Inshallah. Some things are beyond our powers, although we have to try hard. <laughs>
ничему не ходи. У него гранитный камушек в груди. Не ходи к нему навстречу, не ходи. У него гранитный камушек в груди. Tajikistan, Afghanistan's mountainous northern neighbor, is the poorest and most lawless of the countries in Central Asia. Oof. The economy is still reeling after a civil war in the 1990s killed up to 150,000 people. At least 80% of the population live in poverty, and wages in Tajikistan are as low as $5 a month. So it was odd to find top-of-the-range cars on the streets of the capital, Dushanbe. But as my guide Noor explained, an 800-mile border with Afghanistan, the source of 90% of European heroin, has made Tajikistan a major drug transit route. Let's work around. What have we got Audi. here? Audi. Audi. Audi? Mercedes. <laughs> That's it. What's that one there? BMW. Audi. And probably the latest um, uh, Land Rover. And yeah, there's a Toyota. Toyota 4 Rav, yeah. <laughs> Almost every car, you know, all every make. Legitimate you know. work? Maybe, maybe not. You what never do you know. think? I don't think that it's legitimate work, you know, legitimate earnings. I'm just waiting for a Rolls Royce to drive past now. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way anybody can really legitimately afford these type of cars. And they have a joke, even the local Tajiks have a joke. They don't say how much was that car, they say how many kilos did it cost. Drug money is really starting to change this place. The main drugs agency in Dushanbe is so strapped for cash, they have just one van for the whole of the city, and the head of the drug squad doubles up as the driver. We're just off on a drugs raid. We've been waiting around the corner while a, a sting operation was underway, and we think the deal has been done now. We're just racing in with the drug control agency. Uh, we believe some drugs have been confiscated, but um, the raid is still underway, so we're not sure what we're going to find. These raids really are a daily occurrence here in Dushanbe. Um, and it really does bring it home to you, the scale of the problem. Um, and how this really is the source of the heroin when they're just capturing kilo loads all the time. The sting has produced an unlikely dealer. Following a surveillance operation, the drug squad is searching the flat of a 45-year-old mother of six who was trying to sell a kilo and a half of heroin to an undercover officer. And she admitted that it was heroin almost immediately. Yes. But just think, if it's a kilo and a half worth about possibly $400,000, I mean, that's, that's a sort of unimaginable sum of money here, isn't it? It's not, it's not surprising that people are prepared to risk their lives to sell it on, their livelihoods. And how often are you making these sort of drug busts? This amount, about one kilogram, is for domestic use. It's not for export. There are fewer small consignments like this one, whilst the number of bigger consignments for export to Europe is increasing. She knows what's going to happen, doesn't she? After the show, yeah. Afghan drug producers stamp their mark on packs of heroin, an advert and guarantee of the drug's purity. Why, why have you taken the risk? Why have you risked everything for this? I urgently needed money. My husband has left the country to find work in Russia. I was Things then get worse for the woman when police discover this is not her first drugs bust. First time it was for just 100 grams. So she was given five years for 100 grams. Yes. And this is maybe 15 times the amount. Yes. Maybe she'll get um, not five, maybe 10, 15 years for that. 
and she has six children. You, you do feel incredible sympathy when you're standing there and she's weeping and she's in her own home. And I suppose the natural urge is, oh, well, you know, poor you. And yeah, poor her. She's going to go away for a long time now. She, at her age, she might die in prison. Um, but she knows what she's doing. She knows the, the problem. So they've got addicts in Dushanbe now. They know um, just what drugs can do. And as the police were quick to tell us that, you know, she's not quite the innocent she's pointing out. She's got a huge TV. She's done this before. Um, she claims she's only going to get a hundred bucks or something for it, but in fact she was probably going to get a lot more money. So she knew the risks. It's just a pathetic waste of life, isn't it? It's a tragedy. A million men have left Tajikistan to find work abroad. For the women they leave behind, there are few options. This carpet factory once employed thousands, but after the economy collapsed, it now runs at just a fifth of its capacity. Look at this, Will, good British machine. Huddersfield. <laughs> Sellers of Huddersfield. <laughs> traditional type of carpet here. So you can bring so your the wedding photo here yeah, and you, yeah, can, you can turn it into a carpet. Exactly, yeah. Extraordinary. Over there you can see uh, our president with his family. And over there you can see his picture with his wife. He doesn't smile much, does he? Yeah, not really, but here you can see some, <laughs> some kind of smile on his face. It's more <laughs> like a smirk. <laughs> over there you can see Agahan the Force with his wife. Okay, yes, President Putin, his wife. This could really take off. Yeah, I can see yeah. it's working. Yeah. Only the child here seems to be picking its nose. Yes, you think they might not do an exact copy of the photo. The cost of preserving these intimate family moments? Upwards of a thousand dollars. In Tajikistan, you have to do whatever you can to eke out a living. You can call him like a uh, celebrity of the city because uh, he he's showing his beard here, uh, not only in the center of the city but also in the central park. He's showing like this. Does he make his money out of the bear? Yeah, he does, but you know, people cannot pay much, too much, but anyway. The drug squad wanted to show us the scale of the problem they face. This is their storeroom of recently captured drugs. And to give an example, what's in this package here? In this package there is seven and a half kilos of heroin. In this box alone? So that's a couple of million dollars worth of heroin just in there alone? And what about this one? This, uh, All this was taken on one way. This is 151 kilos. This is 151 kilos of... Just one case. In total, how many kilos of heroin are in this room? About 500 So half a ton. That's a huge amount of drugs. Half a ton of heroin. 500 kilos of heroin. How much is that worth on the in London? London? Roughly, approximately about 150 million dollars. That's half the national budget of Tajikistan. And does it feel strange to you that given that Tajikistan is a, is a relatively poor country, that what you're going to do with this 150 million dollars worth of heroin is set it on fire? We may be poor, but we're not criminals. Although we spend billions hunting for heroin in the West, Tajikistan has been given just $9 million by the international community to stem the flow of drugs from Afghanistan. Yet even with limited resources, the Tajiks have seized heroin worth $1.4 billion. So although the, uh, they are very professional here and they've had good training and they really do 
they really are trying to stop the drugs. I mean, look, they, they haven't got enough money here. They've got $150 million worth of heroin alone in this room, which is protected by a pretty antiquated old system. They need more money here. It's ridiculous. The economic hardships have led many here to rue the end of Soviet rule. Lenin kto? Communism. Who is Lenin? Lenin is communism. Absolute Who is Lenin? Lenin is an absolute prophet who said the people should all live well. I think Lenin was the best person, the cleverest person, the most idealistic person, the most human person. That was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Did you get a feeling that people here were much better off under the Soviet Union? There must be some regret, really, that the Soviet Union ever collapsed. For us, it was a really good time. And uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, if any of the former countries gained, like, uh, you know, with, with independence, we just lost almost everything which we had, what we had. So for us, it was a real tragedy. are remembered as the good times, but there is an emerging national tragic identity as we discover that a celebration of the ending of the Civil War. Stars, yeah. uh, because see these stars, I mean, uh, Indian movies are very popular with our people, and uh, most of the people know all these stars. Do you have many cinemas here? Oh yeah, but in all cinemas, mostly right now, you can only watch the, uh, like Bollywood movies. And that's it because they don't show films from, from no, America. Right now, no, because uh, they're so expensive. You, you need to buy them, you know. Western culture hasn't hit Tajikistan yet, and that includes pop music nor took us to meet the man currently at the top of the Tajik charts. Gamin Zavkibekov's band, which includes his son, have seen their record sales rocket since the Soviet Union collapsed. The atheist Soviet system banned religious ceremonies where these old instruments were played. Musicians were even afraid to play them at funerals. <laughs> When the soul leaves the body after someone dies, they would sing about how the soul is sent to heaven. It's traditional to sing about that on these occasions, but some people were afraid of playing these instruments. They, they will just uh, a bit uh, perform for you just some folkloric music. Yeah. But, yeah, but they are yeah, part of that famous group, you know. Okay, which is uh, at top of the charts, you know. <laughs> so. so they're a chart-topping group? Yes. This is like a top of the pops for Tajikistan. Yeah, exactly. Traveling up into the, the mountains, we're passing um, a number of small villages and we've gone through the suburbs of Dushanbe. And there are, I have to say, there's a suspiciously large number of spanking new houses. What do we call those? The people who own those houses? What were you just saying? New Tajiks. New Tajiks. Like new Russians. New business. <laughs> a legal business or not, we don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah, but we can have it again. Yes, probably. yes. All right. Concerned about the future of Tajikistan, whether it's going to be able to claw its way back from becoming a, a narco state. 
because that's one of the principal sources of income for the country, if not the major income. More expensive cars went past, and then a convoy led by General Kasimov, a former warlord who controlled this area during the Civil War. The first car was his, you know, Jack, the newest Jack. The brand new white Jaguar. Exactly. What is he doing now? He's right now actually president of Football Federation of Tajikistan. And at the same time, he's one of the commanders of Ministry of Interior. Who owns the car? The government? The government? No, that's private car. Or that general. Tajik businessman passes by on his way to work. Tajikistan is, you see, is water river. Very clean. Way to fall. Fantastic! Yeah, it's gorgeous. Not what I expected at all. One of the most impressive mountain ranges in the world outside Nepal. Amazing trekking here. And of course nobody comes here because they think it's a war zone. This is our driver. Jackie Chan. <laughs> now, where was the one you just showed me? More worryingly, this is also our driver. Who do you look like? The little moustache. I'm not saying. But he, he said, he himself said he looked a little bit like a certain German leader from the 1930s and 40s. Where is this? India. India. Two times I'm going to India. And this? <laughs> Who is this? Uh, Who is this? My friend. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> Why have you suddenly got embarrassed about that? Come back with the photo. <laughs> Tajikistan is about 93% mountainous. So um, everybody lives, or most people live on that just 7% that's flat ground. But the rest of it is like this, just stunning, gorgeous scenery. But the stunning scenery also causes huge problems. The mountains are virtually impossible to patrol. And as a result, bandits and smugglers have operated here for centuries. It's really hot. <laughs> This really must be the last low-level snow in this range. What's that? I should them. <laughs> the Red Army scored a direct hit which went down my back. Or rather, down the back of my trousers. In the 1980s, Noor fought in the Soviet Red Army in Afghanistan against the Western-backed Mujahideen and men such as Osama bin Laden the very people the West are now battling across the whole region. It looks like absolutely like in Afghanistan. For example, you also can go with your team, you know, searching for Mujahideens over there and they can just sit over there and just observe you and just start you know, shooting at you. You never know they were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that okay, was a whole see. problem for the Red Army, wasn't it? Yeah, how can you understand where are they? See if there are some trees or whatever, even the rocks. And when they start uh, shooting, it's like echoing, you know? Mm. And you can't understand where from they're shooting. Can you imagine having to try and fight in this terrain? Yeah. 
It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem the uh, uh, Americans are having really in northern Afghanistan now with yes, exactly. locating Al Qaeda exactly. and the remnants of the Taliban. Exactly. Because when the guy, these guys get into this sort of terrain, that how would you track them down? And there are so many caves. Absolutely. Yeah, we can see several over there. What division did you serve with? In, in Afghan division. Did your division suffer heavy losses? Almost every, you know, division or every group uh, suffered losses. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, it sparked a five-year civil war that destroyed the Tajik economy and industry. The drugs trade remains a major money earner for Tajiks, but they also have huge mineral resources which are now starting to be exploited. In the remote north of the country, we came across this gold mine, operated by a western firm. One of the managers is a 22-year-old Exitonian called Wills. How much can it pick up? Five cubic meters of rock. Which weighs about? It's about nine tons. Nine tons, each scoop? Each scoop is nine tons. It's capable of moving about 7,000 tons a day. My toys were never like this. Mine are. <laughs> <laughs> Will's father is the boss of the company. So what's a 22-year-old Old Etonian doing here? I came out here originally just uh, for experience, just after school, and I kind of got the bug, and I was meant to go to university. I did try that for a bit, and then I just came back and decided to make this. Uh, it's a big challenge. It's exciting. It's a big challenge. You can make money. What's it actually like working here? I mean, how do you find the, the, the people and the, the country? Because I think people back home would find it a little bit strange and imagine that it's very hard to operate here. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Uh, it, you've got to have quite a lot of patience. I mean, it tests your patience quite a lot. It's just the whole, the whole communist sort of way of thinking, as opposed to our way of thinking. But also, you have to understand them. If, if you just come in here and try and say, oh, you know, we're, we're good and, and we know everything better, it, it won't work. I mean, you'll just you'll go home with your tail between your legs, uh, basically. The company employs 500 Tajiks, who claims to be the biggest foreign investor in the entire country. So what are the predictions for how much you'll be earning from these mines? By the autumn, we probably could be making up to about half a million dollars profit a month. It's a slow process actually getting the gold out of the ground. They have to blast and sift through a ton of rock, then mix it with chemicals such as cyanide, just to get eight grams of gold. A small safety rope with all that protected us from the crusher ahead. In another mine, somebody got stuck in the conveyor, and they got It's an induction furnace, it's the melting pot. It's where all the gold and silver gets melted and we pour it into bars. There's always a little bit of residue. Simon's been quite lucky, he's managed to get some. <laughs> <laughs> so if I glue enough of these together, I can make a small ring. may take some time. We've got a gold room, which is a, is a secure room, and inside that we've got a secure cage, and inside the secure cage we've got a secure room, and inside the secure room we've got a safe. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite secure. Well, that's the end product. 85% silver, 10% gold, $20,000 worth, just there. You better have it back, because I'm so tempted to try and make a break for it. <laughs> Well, there is a gentleman outside with an AK-47. <laughs> if we did have any thoughts about leaving with some of the gold, the gentleman here is going to protect it. AK-47? Kalashnikov, Kalashnikov. Automatic Kalashnikov. You remember the general we saw in the convoy, the one with the uh, brand new Jaguar, we've just come to have a little chat with him, to ask him about the success of the Football Federation, it must be doing very well. The General was a teacher before the Civil War started, when he became a powerful warlord. 
He fought for the ex-communist government against a broad coalition of mild and extreme Islamic groups. Over 100,000 people were killed. When the national economy was almost entirely ruined, things could not get any more miserable. Sometimes I meet up with some of the other commanders. To be honest, we laugh about the fact that we could be such idiots. We fought against each other and we killed each other. The former teacher did rather well out of the war and says he was given this $50,000 car by the president for preventing a coup. Wow. Oh, this is, uh, are these leather? Yes. Look at that. Top of the range. Yeah. And is, is the gun factory fitted? It's almost uh, <laughs> No, I added it <laughs> myself. <laughs> I was worried that that might have been sold by Jaguar. Uh, well, you should tell the manufacturers uh, they should make a special uh, compartment uh, for guns. I've had a lot of But this car is like a friend to me. We talk to each other. I'd like to say thank you to the people who built this car. I hope that the standard of living will rise here so that everyone can drive around in this kind of car. I'm sure that lots of Tajiks will choose a Daimler. Daimler. <laughs> the Tajiks worry about drugs and militants coming from Afghanistan. So we headed south towards the border to see how well it's guarded. We're just going to stop for a brief rest at the Tajik version of a little chef. Salam alaikum. Oh, look at that. Don't get this sort of view on the M25, do you? The beautiful lake down below is actually Tajikistan's biggest reservoir. This makes it one of the most strategically vital spots in the whole country. You can survive without oil, but you can't, you cannot survive without water. The reservoir also provides water for Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, making it a potential strategic weapon for the Tajiks. So if they annoy the Tajik government, the Tajik government turn off their water supply? Possibly, yes, possibly, but they never do that. I don't know why. But they got the power. They got the power, yes. Water is like our, our oil, so that's why maybe we are more richer than some oil-producing countries, like Kazakhstan or even Emirates or Saudi Arabia. After lunch, the cafe owner took us around the back to show us his popular tourist attraction. He found this bust of Lenin on a rubbish dump after it was pulled down following the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> yes, uh, he says it's like a tourist attraction because quite recently some Iranians and Chinese were here and they uh, took pictures with uh, Lenin. They said that he is really great. I mean, uh, his role in history also. So he likes Lenin. Yes, definitely. Yes, he is not. A, he says I'm not a communist, but I, I actually uh, I love him because he's really great figure. He says. In Tajikistan, women happily abandoned Russian-style clothes which are associated with their former masters. Where is she going? <laughs> but unlike neighbouring Afghanistan, where the Taliban ruled that women must wear head-to-toe burqas, women here have never had to hide their faces. Poppies were a sign that we were nearing the dangerous Afghan border. We first had to stop at a Tajik army base to pick up an armed escort. Remnants of the Soviet past still litter the base here. 
Despite being independent for 12 years, these conscripts will soon be wearing old Soviet uniforms. This is in memoriam of those who lost their lives during either uh, the civil war or uh, on the border during patrolling in Afghanistan. Quite a few names. Yes, even here you can see that, for example, one of them was just 20 years old and the second one was like 24 years old. They're just trying to fix the van. I mean, it's one of the problems. They're guarding quite a long border and um, they only have one vehicle, which they're quite embarrassed about. But they say it's a huge problem. They don't have transport. They can't shift soldiers around. And even when um, now we've turned up and they want to go and they want to show us the border, they can't get their single vehicle started. Do you think they're going to get this started? We should have a hold you know, for that. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One vehicle and no radios, the border is very difficult to patrol. As we neared Afghanistan, some familiar sights greeted us. Who lives there? Probably someone from local elite. Probably local drug dealer. I'm not entirely sure what's going on. It's some sort of special escape and evasion te te technique, I think. Coupled with an attacking Tajik border dog. What is it? These sons of Tajikistan are protecting the state border. They're not going to let this evil dog go further than Europe. Here they are, these brave lads. Day and night, through snow and cold. These brave soldiers of ours, they're protecting us. And what is their average age? Roughly how old are these guys? 18 or 19. There are two things the troops are trying to prevent crossing the border. One is heroin grown in the vast poppy fields across the river, and the other is Islamic militants left over from the Afghan war. See that white building on that side? It's uh, like madrasa. That's a madrasa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, uh, like religious school. Yeah. It was religious schools like this that brainwashed thousands of young men into hating the West. Well? Yeah, but the logistical part mm. of all this. Yeah. So you can see, pretty conditions are basic to say the least, and it must get absolutely freezing cold in here oh, yeah. during winter. No heaters at all. So. No heaters at all. You're protecting the border. You're 20 years old, or you're a major, and you're a little bit older. 
and you're earning five dollars a month. Five dollars a month. And people are passing drugs back across the back and forth across the border that are worth hundreds of thousands. I mean temptation is obvious, isn't it? This is where they keep their food. They have they don't have a, a single fridge here at all. And as you can see, they don't, have, they don't exactly have much food either. So what have we got? We've got wheat and maize and some flour. Not good quality. Not good quality at all, is it? Mm. It's lovely and hot. Straight out of the oven. On a Tajik army base next to Afghanistan. It's delicious. These conscripts have hardly any money and little equipment, yet they're the first line of defense against the heroin and militants coming from Afghanistan. This is when you start to feel a little bit guilty because for the soldiers here, this is an absolute feast. They wouldn't normally eat all this food. They're eating it because we're here. In one? Yes. In one? Yes. Okay. You guys already used it. Okay. We've just left the uh, Tajik border post. We couldn't film all of it because the secret police were there. But um, I can now report that they made us drink vast quantities of vodka. I'm now extremely drunk. And now we have to drive for two hours on the worst road in Central Asia. <laughs> and then we have to drink some more vodka. I soon became a victim of overwhelming hospitality combined with alcohol, nicknamed vodka terrorism. Magnificent shashlik. Just between you and me, okay, well, so far I've hidden, I've soaked my napkin in some of the vodka and hidden it in my sock and some of it I've poured into my drink some of it was poured into your drink and now I'm going to start pouring it into my water bottle which is hidden under the table <laughs> Many hours later, we finally left the border for the safety of a garrison town two hours away, where we would spend our final night before flying home. Although we have encountered nothing but hospitality and friendliness from the Tajiks, this is still the border with Afghanistan. It is still a region troubled by extremism and violence. Um, and although we're 90% sure we'll be completely okay. I think when the lights of the garrison come into view, we'll all feel a whole lot safer.